Good afternoon, everybody. My mission this afternoon is to give you all something you can do every day to help save our oceans. Have you ever wondered, what, what is the first question that uh, you hear from diners at a seafood restaurant? Is it fresh? Is the fish fresh? Is it fresh? That's because they've been taught that fresh is better than frozen and because they don't want to get sick. They don't want a you know, side order of paralytic shellfish poisoning with their bouillabaisse. My favorite answer, uh, my favorite question uh, from diners is really the second one that you hear, and that is, where's the fish from? Where's the fish from? And the answers are all over the map. My favorite answer is, it's from the ocean. But the, the best answer, the one I get a lot of seafood restaurants, it's, it's from the truck, because that's all that many times the wait staff knows. The truck pulls up back of the restaurant every morning and unloads the fish. The fish is from the truck. More uh, accurate answer would be uh, the fish is from overseas, because today about 85% or more of our seafood in the United States is imported from somewhere overseas, Asia, Latin America, Africa, and so forth. So we only produce farm or fish less than 15% of our own seafood in the United States. A lot of people don't realize that. My office here, where you're all going to go, hopefully, for a reception after the talks this afternoon, overlooks Fisherman's Wharf on the downtown waterfront here. Fisherman's Wharf is visited every year by millions of tourists. And they go to one of the many seafood restaurants on the wharf. And they expect, because it's called Fisherman's Wharf, that the fish arrives there by boat. You know, the boats tie up, and they offload the fish, and you get to eat it in the restaurant. Wrong. I see every day how the fish actually gets to Fisherman's Wharf. And it's not by boat, it's by truck. It's by refrigerated truck from the ports. Because remember, 85% of our seafood is imported, so it arrives by truck and not by boat. Fisherman's Wharf, one of the signature dishes out there is Monterey-style clam chowder in the bread bowl. Some of you probably had that. We all assume that that means that cl the clams uh, are from Monterey, right? Clam chowder? Well, guess what? The Monterey-style clam chowder, the clams are from Indonesia, or the Philippines, or Thailand. We do grow clams off the California coast in aquaculture facilities, but not from Monterey. So if you hear something like Chesapeake-style blue crab, guess what? It's not from the Chesapeake Bay. It's from uh, the Philippines and Indonesia. Well, why is that? Why do we import most of our seafood nowadays? It's really because we've managed our own fisheries so poorly over the years that we've, we've overfished them so badly that we have to import all of our seafood from overseas. Let me show you what I mean. This is a snapshot of the North Atlantic at the turn of the last century. And it shows you the biomass of tablefish, cod, and haddock, and flounder, and so forth, that were there at that time. A hundred years later, this is what the picture looks like. That's what's left at the turn of this century in the North Atlantic. And that isn't because of some planetary threat like global warming or whatever. It's because we caught them all and ate them. So unless you think, of course, that the problem is confined to the Atlantic, here's what it looks like in California. Our, in the last 30 years, the state tells us that our commercial fish landings in California have dropped by 50 to 75 percent, both in terms of the pounds and value. So our fisheries are in trouble across the United States. We've taken too many, but it's not just overfishing that's the problem. We not only take too many, we take fish selectively. What do we like to eat? We like to eat the big predators of the ocean, the tuna, the swordfish the salmon, as if we were eating mountain lions and grizzly bears on land, or taking out the top predators selectively, because that's what we love to eat. It's called, the phenomenon's called fishing down the food chain, and pretty soon we're down to sardines and herring, and if we're not careful, the catch of the day pretty soon is going to be jellyfish. And I'm not, I don't know about you, but uh, I'm not a big fan of eating jellyfish. So not only are we taking too much and taking the big predators out of the ecosystem, the way we fish is often non-selective and very destructive. We fish with long lines, bottom trawls. We fish with gill nets like this one that's caught a dolphin off of New Zealand and drowned it. But scientists tell us that one quarter to one third of the entire world catch is discarded and wasted, thrown back into the ocean dead and dying. The upshot of all of this is that scientists have projected that we may run out of wild caught seafood by 2048. Now, that's not a prediction, and this has been disputed by fishery scientists, by the way, who think that there's nothing wrong with taking the populations down for the benefit of fisheries. But, and it's, this is not inevitable. This is a call to action. 
really. It's a warning that if we don't do something to improve the management of our oceans, we're going to be in trouble. What is it that people think is the biggest threat to our oceans, though? When the President of the United States goes to the Gulf of Mexico to supervise the cleanup, people are going to think that oil spills are the biggest threat to our oceans. They make the headlines every time they happen, whether it's in Alaska or the Gulf of Mexico. And of course, these are bona fide disasters where they happen. Oil birds, terrible stories of human and ecological disaster. But scientists tell us that oil spills, as disastrous as they are locally where they happen, are nowhere near the biggest threat to our oceans. The biggest threat to our oceans is not oil pollution, it's carbon pollution. And we have abundant evidence of what that is going to do to our oceans over the next 100 years or so. Carbon pollution that leads to global warming causes the sea temperature to rise, causes the polar ice caps to melt, causes things like polar bears to have trouble finding food. It means that when carbon dioxide is absorbed by our oceans, which after all are 70 percent of the planet, they become more acidic, so we get so-called ocean acidification. And that's really bad news if you're an oyster, because oysters have calcium carbonate shells, and what dissolves calcium carbonate? Acid. So if you're an oyster, you're, uh, we call it the naked oyster problem. And it's a big one. But the fact is, we can't do much about climate change, or even if we stopped doing all the things that lead to climate change today, we would be living with the impact of climate change for some time into the future. So we may not be able to do anything in our lifetime to help turn around climate change and its impact on our ocean, but there are lots of things we can do something about. Coastal development, pollution of our oceans, overfishing and so forth, we can do things about them today. And the good news is that our oceans are resilient enough to bounce back. My colleague Steve Palumbi, who runs the Stanford Marine Lab, Hopkins Marine Lab on Cannery Row, just published a book recently called The Death and Life of Monterey Bay. If you haven't read it, you might want to get a copy because it's a real message of hope. What he tells in this book is the story of what Monterey Bay was like when the canneries were here 100 years ago. 100 years ago, the canneries collectively were dumping 100,000 pounds of fish guts into the bay every day. Every day. Monterey Bay was a dead zone. It smelled so bad, nobody wanted to live in New Monterey, where lots of people live today. But eventually, the canneries went away. The sardines got overfished, the industry collapsed, the canneries went away, and Monterey Bay recovered. That's why he calls it the death and rebirth, life of Monterey Bay. Because today, where that once was a dead zone, we have a thriving kelp forest out in front of the aquarium and cannery row, people tanking every day, seeing sea otters and harbor seals, and it's a thriving ecosystem. So our oceans do have the ability to recover. But how are we going to make that happen? How how can we go about that? The oceans, you've heard today so many talks about, you know, we're, we're much better at the I have a nightmare speech than the I have a dream speech. One thing we've learned over the years is we can't rely on politicians to do it by themselves. Politicians, governments alone, won't be able to save our oceans. We need to help them. And that's because Congress, people in Congress are not going to make tough choices, especially if they cost jobs. Every time they try to make a tough decision but necessary decision to save our oceans, Somebody goes in from industry and says, you know what, you shouldn't do that because stop them from doing that because it's going to cost us jobs and short-term profits. And of course, politicians respond to that. So the government is going to need help. Well, there, that's the good news. Every one of us can help. And this is how we can do it. When we eat seafood, many of us are seafood lovers here. We don't want to give up seafood. It's not necessary to give up seafood. The United Nations tells us that if we manage our fisheries better around the world, the oceans can yield a lot more than they do now when oceans aren't managed very well. So at the Monterey Bay Aquarium, we invented a simple technique 10 years ago, a simple program called Seafood Watch to give people who love seafood better advice on making choices in the restaurants, making choices at the fish market. Red, green, and yellow. The green is best choices. The, uh, the yellow is good alternatives. And the, uh, the red are seafood to avoid because the fisheries aren't managed well enough yet. And of course, we're trying to help fisheries transition off the red to the yellow to the green. We even have a sushi card, the regional cards for all over the United States. And we've, we have about 40 million of these cards on the street in the last decade since the program started. And of course, nowadays, if you have a smartphone, you can download free Seafood Watch applications for the iPhone and the Droid. And you can be a really boring dinner companion, telling your friends to stop eating that Chilean sea bass, give up the farm salmon, 
choose the uh, Alaskan halibut instead or the wild salmon from Alaska, much better choices. If you're really into this, you can come to the best party of the year at the aquarium, Cooking for Solutions every May. We throw a big celebration of sustainable cuisine at the aquarium called Cooking for Solutions, not just seafood. We now have restaurants, wineries, chefs competing to be part of this event to show us how sustainable they are. And that's a good sign because it means the industry is changing. You can also rely on an eco-label, the first eco-label for seafood. Uh, the Marine Stewardship Council was created about 15 years ago in Europe. It is now certified about 10% of the world's seafood supply is under this eco-label. And people can look for it every day. You can see it here in Whole Foods in Monterey in front of the delicious looking deep red sockeye salmon, wild salmon from Alaska. You're going to hear about that in the next talk a little bit more. But this is a great green listed choice. It's healthier for you than farm salmon. And you can see some stark contrasts at the same place, Whole Foods, right next to one another. On the left, red listed, pallid, farm salmon, Atlantic salmon. On the right, delicious, deep red, orange, wild salmon from Alaska bearing the eco label. The choice is clear. Which of those is a better choice for the oceans and for you? And by the way, this choice is disappearing because Whole Foods has announced that on Earth Day 2012, they are removing all red-listed seafood from all of their stores. And they deserve a lot of credit. <clears throat> Those of you who are inclined to make better choices have a new and exciting choice. You're going to hear about this this afternoon, too. Local Catch Monterey, created by a couple of guys with a van, are connecting <laughs> conscious consumers with local fishermen and you can rely on this because they're abiding by the Seafood Watch recommendations. They're only selling seafood from the yellow and green list. You can pick it up, just like your community-supported agriculture program where you get a box of, of strange vegetables every week or so. Here, you can pick up your fish box every week with local catch and just make sure you pick it up and you don't wait a couple of days in this case. So the upshot of all these programs is that Hundreds of thousands of consumers have begun to make better choices for our oceans. We estimate through market research that about half a million consumers in the United States are now using one of these programs to make better choices. And the good news is it doesn't stop there. It's not just us that are making these choices. We have begun to influence the biggest seafood buyers in the nation. The biggest retailer in the world is Walmart, believe it or not, and they sell more food at retail in the United States than any other company. They've made a commitment to sustainable seafood right along with Whole Foods and the big food service companies that serve millions of meals every day, Aramark and the Compass Group, Bon Appetit. These are companies that order millions of pounds of seafood a year, so their choices really matter. After all, if it's not on the menu and not on the shelves, you and I can't buy it anyway. So I'm optimistic that these programs, that the hundreds of thousands of consumers around the world that are making better choices that those big seafood buyers that have been persuaded to make better choices for our oceans, they can contribute very powerful commercial incentives for uh, healthier oceans. So the next time you go out to a seafood restaurant or to your retailer and you ask, is the, is the fish fresh? Or where is it from? If you don't get a satisfactory answer, ask them, is your seafood sustainable? And if you, if you don't get the answer you're looking for, whip out your seafood watch card, whip out your iPhone, and do a little education of your own, because you, we can all help save the oceans one plate at a time. Thank you very much.